Praise God. What a wonderful, wonderful conference that we are having and experiencing the presence of God. Amen. Are you enjoying it so far? What a tremendous experience in the Word of God that we had uh, from last night from our, our guest speaker, uh, Brother Woodward. And of course, this morning we heard from uh, Brother Clement. Uh, what a, just challenging messages. Just God speaking to us as a church and ministering to us. And if we tune in very closely, we will hear the voice of God for our lives. Amen. How many are hungry for God? You want more of the Lord. Amen. Praise God. Well, thank you for this opportunity. I want to thank our general superintendent, uh, Brother John Downs, and, and the executive board for this great honor. For me to come and be able to minister and bring the word of God to you this evening. Uh, it is always a daunting a task uh, to do that to this national church, to bring the word. And I pray with God's help that I may be able to share to you what God has placed upon my heart. Praise God. What delight it is to be able to fellowship with one another. To see pastors from other cities and other churches to be together as one big family. Amen. And uh, to be able to fellowship with each and every one of you, that's to me one of the most wonderful things about conference, is to be able to get together as family. We get to see each other maybe once, twice a year, uh, but it is very refreshing and rewarding uh, that we can do that for each other. And it's so important that we make this a priority to be together. Amen. Well, without further ado, let's get to the word of the Lord in Genesis chapter 26. If you have your Bibles with you, I want to invite you to stand for the reading of God's Word in honor of His Word. I know you've been standing for some time, but I will try and read quickly. Genesis chapter 26 and verse number 12. Praise God. Wonderful worship, wonderful presence of God that we're here enjoying tonight. Genesis 26 and verse 12, the Bible says that Isaac sowed in that land and received in the same year a hundredfold and the Lord blessed the Lord blessed him and the man waxed great and went forward and grew until he became very great for he had possessions of flocks and possessions of herds and great store of servants and the Philistines envied him for all the wells which his father's servants had digged in the days of Abraham his father the Philistines had stopped them and filled them with earth. And Abimelech said unto Isaac, Go from us, for thou art much mightier than we. And Isaac departed thence and pitched his tent in the valley of Gerar and dwelt there. And Isaac digged again the wells of water which they had digged in the days of Abraham his father. For the Philistines had stopped them for the death, after the death of Abraham. And he called their names after the names by which his father had called them. That's what his dad called them, and so that's what they were going to be called. And Isaac's servants digged in the valley and found there a well of springing water. And the herdsmen of Gerard did strive with Isaac's herdmen, saying, The water is ours. And he called the name of the well Isaac, because they strove with him. And they digged another well and strove for that also and called the name of it Sidna. And he removed from thence and digged another well, and from there... From that they strove not, and he called the name of it Rehoboth, and he said, For now the Lord has made room for us, and we shall be fruitful in the land. One more passage of scripture in Galatians chapter 3, verse number 6 and 7. It says, Even as Abraham believed God, it was accounted to him for righteousness. Know ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. Praise God. I want to talk to you tonight with the help of the Lord on this thought, reclaiming our inheritance. Reclaiming our inheritance. Would you lift your voices one more time in prayer and let's ask the Lord to speak to us one more time. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your presence that we feel here tonight. We ask you, Lord God, that once again your anointing would flow in this place. In the midst of your people, Lord God, let your spirit flow and touch us as you anoint your servant and your people. We ask you, Lord, to anoint your servant, to give me the words that you would have your people to hear. 
Help me to declare nothing more, nothing less than what you want us to receive. We thank you once again, O oh Lord. We are so grateful that we can hear your word, that we can be blessed of you as we give you thanks and praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you clap your hands one more time and give them praise? Give your neighbor a high five and tell them I'm going to reclaim my inheritance. God bless you. you. May be seated. Isaac is not one of those personalities that most people name when they are asked to name their favorite Bible character. He does not draw the same kind of awe and admiration of a brave young David uh, with his feats or the prophet Moses with the miracles that he had accomplished and great feats and wonders for God. No, with Isaac he is often forgotten and, and he's often really when he is remembered, he is remembered more for the things that he didn't do than for the things that he did do. He is remembered more for the people that are around him. He is known more as the result of the great faith of Abraham and Sarah, uh, that he was the promised child, and he didn't have to do very much about that. Uh, he was known more for uh, the one that was to be sacrificed on Mount Moriah. He was the victim that was saved, and again, all he did was just simply uh, comply didn't do very much and before he can even really gain any limelight in the Bible his twin boys who are just being born get more press than him I feel a little sorry for Isaac don't you you see he doesn't strike us as somebody who's a go-getter or who is a bold leader as a matter of fact he is one of those uh, perhaps in my mind incorrectly perhaps this is a misconception in my understanding of Isaac that if I try to compare him to somebody today he is like one of those guys in their 30s and 40s who still live with their moms and dads maybe in the basement I mean you know you could probably say he was a bit of a loser <laughs> compared to those other guys of course he wasn't a loser but you know in stark contrast to these great personalities of the Bible I mean, he couldn't even get his own wife. He had to have somebody get his wife for him. So that doesn't strike me as somebody with much initiative or courage. Uh, you know, he may have had a 30-year adolescence. You know how they lived a long time in Bible days? His adolescence may have lasted 30 years. He could have been one of those guys in their 40s still playing video games. And I'm not having a go of you if you're, if you're that. That's, that's your choice. It may be a little harsh. I admit that might be a little harsh. But, but there's really only one chapter in all of Genesis that is purely dedicated to Isaac. And this is it. In Genesis, Genesis chapter 26, we read in verse 1 that there was a famine in the land. And uh, beside the first famine that came, that was in the days of Abraham, there was famine in the land and, 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 and you see famines all throughout scripture and, and even though there was famine in the land the Bible also tells us that Isaac sowed in the land in the midst of a famine Isaac still sowed and not only that not only did he sow but he received in the same year a hundredfold and the Lord blessed him Go figure, it, it, there's a famine in the land, and he's gone ahead and sowed, and even, not next year, but in the same year, God blesses him with the harvest. Amen. I think he's come to understand a principle here today, uh, that if you sow, you're going to have a reaping, you're going to have a harvest. Amen. It doesn't matter what the land looks like, even if there's famine in the land, you can still sow. In fact, I submit to you that there is a famine in the land of Australia, not the famine of food or the famine of water, but a famine of hearing of the words of God, according to Amos. 
Amen. We're in a famine right now, spiritually, in this nation. Uh, the people, the, the, the things that are happening right now, we know we lost that postal vote. Amen. But can I tell you, even in the midst of this famine, we can still sow the word of God. Amen. We've heard from the word of God. We've heard it once now. We've heard it once from God. He's spoken it once. Now we've got to hear it twice. We've got to declare the word of God even in the famine. We've got to sow. Amen. So no matter how dry it is, can I talk to some pastor here today? Uh, can I talk to a home missionary regardless of how slow it might seem that there's no results? Uh, can I tell you if you would just keep sowing, uh, keep preaching the Bible, uh, keep preaching the Word of God, uh, keep going to the streets, uh, keep going to that Bible study, even if they don't get baptized yet, even if they're not filled with the Holy Ghost yet, uh, keep sowing, keep sowing, keep sowing, because it's, it's a principle in the word of God that when you sow you shall reap amen when you sow it's gotta come it might tarry a little while it may take a few months but I've got a God who's a blesser he'll bless you in the midst of a famine you're gonna have prosperity you're gonna have a blessing from God oh I wish somebody would hear me tonight I think I'm going a little too fast right now but I've simply come to declare a word from God to you tonight in the midst of your dryness in the midst of your famine keep sowing keep sowing keep sowing the latter rain's gonna come the spirit of God is going to fall upon you and when you sow you're gonna reap oh hallelujah how many know that God is a blesser how many know my God wants to bless me hallelujah hallelujah Amen, I think we've become a little scared because of all of these prosperity preachers that have gone into the world and have given Christianity a bad name. But can I tell you that my God is a blesser. He wants to give to us. The Bible says he gave Isaac a hundredfold. You know what that means? It means he gave him a hundred times what he had. And so if he had just 500 sheep, by the end of the year, he had 50,000 heads of sheep if he had a hundred goats by the end of the year he had 10,000 heads of goats don't tell me my God can bless don't tell me he doesn't want us to be prosperous amen he wants his people to be prosperous to be blessed oh I think I've jumped ahead of myself Hallelujah. The word of God tells us in Amos, uh, praise the Lord, in Psalms chapter 35, he said, let the Lord be magnified because he has pleasure in the prosperity of his servant. Amen. That's not from the Message Bible. Uh, that's from the King James Version. That's not from the Rick James, as Brother Emery would say, but that's the King James that says that he gets happy when we become prosperous. And can I tell you, your loving Father wants you to be prosperous. He wants wants you to be blessed he wants you to he wants to give you a hundredfold revival oh I wish I had about two pastors just two pastors in here who's believing God for a hundred soul revival a hundred fold revival that God wants to give you glory to God hallelujah so here he is he's experiencing the blessings of God He's got five with thousands of, of sheep. His livestock are flourishing. He's got men servants. He's got so many servants to look after them. And yet he's got a little problem. He is in the midst of a famine and he's run out of water to feed them. He's got no water to give them. And so this is the problem for him. What good is having the blessings of God? What good is having all of these things? if you don't have anything by which to sustain the blessings of God. 50,000 heads of sheep, that's good, but, but by the end of the season, it's going to be 50,000 carcasses in the middle of the wilderness. Good for nothing. And so he needed to get some water. Amen. Can I make it plain here tonight? Amen. You might have had the blessings of God. Thank God for his blessings upon your life. Thank God for every good and perfect gift the Bible says comes from above and from the Father of lights. And we thank the Lord for that job. We thank God for that nice car and the house that God has blessed you with. That's wonderful. But what 
good as all of the blessings of God if you have nothing by which to sustain your spiritual life. Amen. It's all right to have the blessings of God. But what we need more than anything, we need some life-sustaining water. We need some water that will give us sustenance, that will quench our thirst. We need some water that would give us life. Amen. Thank you for the house. But a house is not going to give me to heaven. Thank you for the job. But job is not going to give me to heaven. Thank you, Lord, for the money and the decimals in my bank account. But that's not going to get anybody saved. What I need is a life living, a life giving water of the Holy Ghost. I want you to know tonight, no matter what you have here, regardless of how blessed or not blessed you have, you are. What you need is the river of living water once again to flow out of the depths of you. And can I tell you the good news? The good news is it's here tonight. The Spirit of God is flowing one more time. The Spirit of Almighty God. Hallelujah. Can I remind you tonight that if I'm talking to somebody who's a guest here, that there's nothing that can satisfy you like Jesus can. You might have had all the good things. You might have had a party life and, and, and popular with friends and, and all of that. But let me tell you, nothing can satisfy like Jesus can. Amen. You're looking at a bunch of Pentecostals who have tried it, who have been there and done that. And we've tasted what the world can offer. And can I tell you, it gives you nothing. It does not satisfy. But there is one that satisfies. And his name is Jesus. He's the lover of my soul. He's the keeper of my heart. He's the joy unspeakable and full of glory in my spirit hallelujah glory to God and so what does he do what does Isaac do he goes back to where he knows there's water he goes back to the source of where it comes from he recognizes that if he doesn't get any water that they're gonna die and so he looks around and he goes and he recognizes and re-remembers and realizes, hang on a minute, I, I don't have to perish. My, my, my sheep and my, my cattle and my livestock, they don't have to perish in the wilderness because I know where there's water. Amen. My, my father, you see, dug some wells. I, I, don't, I can't quite remember all of them, but I know I've got some wells. And whatever wells my, my father dug, it belongs to me. And so he gets up. He said, come on, guys. We've got to look for some water. And so he goes on the journey. He says, I know where my father. And if it was my father's, then it belongs to me. And so he goes looking. He goes back to the source. He goes back to where he knows there's something that works. I'd like to make another inference here tonight. I can't even get to my message but I want to tell you that you got to go back to the source. Amen. You've got to go to where it works. You've tried everything. You've tried going to this, that, and the other. you tried money. you tried drugs and you know, amen, it hasn't satisfied you but you can go back to where it works. You can go back to the source. The source still works. We don't have to make up some new formula from the tops of our heads but we can go Go back to where our forefathers, where they worked, where our forefathers gave of their lives, where the apostles had preached this message. Can I tell you tonight, it's still the same formula. It still works. It's still the saving message that gets people that can take a drug addict and put them in the house of God. It's still the same message that can take somebody on the street corner and place them on the amen corner. It's the same message. It's the same revelation. Amen. Repent and be baptized. Here it is. You want to know what it is to be saved? Repent and be baptized. Every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins and you shall be filled with the gift of the Holy Ghost. Oh, I know you've heard that before, but I wish I just had a handful of apostolics who are still excited about Acts 2.38. I don't know about you, but I wasn't saved in this thing. And when I heard Acts 2.38, it changed my life. It transformed me. Is there anybody here that still remembers the saving power of Acts 2.38? Glory to God. Hallelujah. Glory to God. And so we've got to go back to where it works. We've got to go back to the source. 
Friend, can I tell you, if it was good enough for Brother Bogue, amen, it ought to be good enough for us. If it was good enough for our late Bishop Slack, who these men gave their lives for, and more recently, these men of God, Brother Jacobson, Brother Glass, Brother Turkington, these great men that have paid the price, who sacrificed their lives, if it was good enough for them to turn their back on the world, to, to declare the pre the word of God, to preach the word of God without fear or favor of man. If it was good enough for them, can I tell you it's good enough for us? Amen. We've got to go back to the source. Hallelujah. We've got to go to where we know it works. It still works. Amen. It's still the, the answer for this world. It's not politics. It's not politicians. It's not our prime minister. It's not even the postal vote. And we got to do all that we can. Yes, we do. Amen. But let me tell you what the world needs. It needs some living water. It needs a well of living water that would bubble up for everlasting, that would flow into everlasting life. It's still the same answer. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Digging a well was considered tantamount to a claim of ownership of the land of which it was located. It wasn't just that he needed water to sustain his flock. The wells represented ownership. If he had wells that belonged to him, it, mean, it meant that the land was his. It, it was like a landmark in the land that says, this is my well. This is my, you'll remember the story of Jesus when he went to Samaria and saw the woman, the well, Jacob's well. Wells were very significant in the time of the Bible. It represented ownership. And so it wasn't that, that Isaac was just trying to feed and to sustain his flock, but it was that he was claiming what belonged to him. He was claiming what was his and what he needed to find and to achieve. So he gets there. And so Isaac starts to dig. See, the word of God and the work of the Lord requires work. Amen. He finds that the well is, is covered up. It's got all kinds of, this is, this is my well. <laughs> it's not quite a well, of course, but let's pretend tonight this is a well. I couldn't, I couldn't dig through this platform. So but this goes all the way down into the artesian water. Of the ACT and he gets to his well he knows where it is but he can't access the water because it's been blocked up by the Philistines his enemy had come and had 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 stuffed it, it you know, had blocked it up with earth and soil and rocks and so he begins to dig he begins to take this well that belonged to him but of course there was opposition verse number 20 the Bible tells us and the herdmen of Gerard did strive with Isaac's herdmen, saying, The water is ours. And he called the name of the well Isaac, because they strove with him. Amen. They, 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 he found when he came to claim what belonged to him, what was rightly his, by his birthright, the enemy had come to stop him and keep him from getting access to what belonged to him. Can I tell you here tonight, UPC of Australia, amen, that anything good comes with opposition. Amen. Anything worthwhile, you're going to find there's a battle uh, that's at hand. Amen. But don't you be discouraged by the fight. Uh, don't you turn around and walk away and be afraid. But this is the hour and this is the time that when you find yourself in the middle of a battle, uh, just remember that there is a blessing on the other side. Amen. The reason why it's tough, because there's a blessing coming for you. Uh, can I tell somebody, I've come to give a word of encouragement for you. Uh, the fight and the battle that you find yourself in it's only because the enemy does not want you to access what belongs to you but don't you give up don't you turn around and walk away or throw the towel in but you've got to stand your ground and say I'm not leaving here I know it's tough I know it's hard I know I can't make it sometimes and I feel like I can't go on but listen to me what you've got to do as a child of God as a Christian is you've got to you just got to pull yourself up by your own bootstraps you've got to put your buckle on them and puff your chest out and say come on I'm ready I don't have much strength left but I know that God is on my side that belongs to me devil and I'm not giving up I'm not giving it up to you I'm gonna claim what is mine I'm gonna claim what belongs to me 
Even if I've got a fight, I'll fight. Can I tell you, folks, there are some fights that are not worth fighting about. There are some things you just got to walk away. But when it comes to your inheritance, when it comes to what belongs, what God wants for you, you've got to fight on. You've got to press on. Oh, hallelujah. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Amen. Sometimes Christianity is hard. I yes, it is tough. I admit to you it is tough. It's simple, but it's tough. But hear me today. Christianity is not for wimps. And if you can learn just to stay in the fight, he doesn't expect you to know all the answers. God doesn't expect you to have everything sorted out in your mind. But what he does expect you is that when you've done all to stand, stand there for for amen and just fight hallelujah glory to god I think we've got too many wimpy Christians. Amen. If you're a new Christian here tonight, I want you to, if you remember nothing from this message, remember this one thing, is that you've got to stay in the fight. He that endures to the end shall be saved. Jesus already said, he said, tribulation's going to come. He said, offenses are going to come. Don't you let that stop you from standing your ground. Staying in the fight. Hallelujah. You may not have, you won't always have this incredible revelation from God and the light beam from heaven will not come down in your room when you're going through tribulation. When you're in the valley, you won't always see the hand of God also clearly in your life. When you're going through the battle of your life, you won't always recognize God's hand upon you. But hear me, if you find yourself in the valley, walking through the valley of the shadow of death, don't forget the rest of that scripture. It says, I will be with you, yea, though I walk. Thou art with me, for your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Hallelujah. Glory to God. And sometimes that's all you got to do. It's, it's just stand. When you don't know, and, and even the, the battles that we have in our own minds, the fight that we have within even ourselves, and the struggle with this flesh, I don't want to go to church. I don't feel like going to conference. It's too expensive. The hotel. Well, you can go to the caravan park. Oh, it stinks. I don't know if I want to pray. I prayed already. It didn't work. These people at church, you know, they, when I first came, I thought they had halos on their heads and they had wings in their backs. But if when I looked a little closer, sometimes I could see a horn. That's not anybody here, of course. It's... Christianity is tough. I admit it can be tough. Except for you super spiritual ones. For me, it, it, it was a battle. I had to fight through some stuff. And there were times where I didn't pray and I didn't want to go to church and I didn't want to open up the Bible but here's one key one lesson we can learn from Isaac is that he didn't he didn't cower away from from the fight because that was his he said I don't care if you fight me that belongs to me if it didn't belong to him he would have said okay fine you have whatever you want that's not mine I think he would have been smart enough to do that, but he fought because it belonged to him. How many of us have walked away and we've given up because we thought, are we just too much, it's too hard, and yet we failed to see, we failed to grasp the promise and the will of God for our lives. Amen. We, we were this close to seeing the blessings and the promises of God being realized in our lives, and yet we walked away because it was too much of a fight. I'm talking to some Pentecostals here tonight. If you get nothing else, is that you can strengthen your resolve. You've got to get a bit of, you got to, somebody 
some of my Kiwi brothers and sisters in New Zealand say, you've got to swallow a teaspoon of cement, and you've got to harden up, and you've got to toughen up as a Christian. Amen. God's looking for an army. He's raising up an army. He's not raising up a bunch of hippies and, and flower power. He's raising up an army. Amen. That will stand the test. That will stand and are ready to fight. Come on, devil. Give to me your best shot. I'm not going anywhere. I've been to the world already. I've already tasted that. And it's given me nothing. Oh, hallelujah. But how many know that what God has given us, He's given us the blessings. He's given us joy. He's given us peace. Hallelujah. Glory to God. It's time to reclaim our inheritance. That belonged to, to Isaac. He didn't do too many great things that we, we often celebrate in story and scripture. But one thing he did do, he came to recognize what was his. And he said, I'm going to get what belongs to me. I wish to God tonight that somebody would recognize, amen, what is due to them. We already heard it last night from Brother Woodward. What an amazing preacher that man is. He said to us that greater things than these shall you do. Amen. Can I tell you your promises and your inheritance that belongs to you is waiting for you to unearth once again. It's waiting for you to reveal what's in your life. Amen. He gave us some promises. What's inherited to you when you go back all the way to the Bible, it tells us, amen, that on the day of Pentecost, when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing and a mighty wind and it filled all the house where they were sitting and suddenly it appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and they began to speak in other tongues. I'm telling you when they got the Holy Ghost it spilled out of the upper room and they went to preach on the streets and they turned their city upside down. Amen. That's my inheritance. I don't know about you. My inheritance Inheritance, not all. Uh, let's sing three songs and clap. And, and, and I'm, all, I'm all for programs, but hear me today. You've got to recognize my inheritance is the Pentecostal power, is the Spirit of Almighty God moving in the land. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Can I tell you what else? Can I tell you what else you have that's inherited to you? Amen. The Bible says when Peter and John went to the house of God to pray and they saw a man at the gate beautiful. Amen. They looked around their pockets. They didn't have any money. And then he said, okay. Amen. But I got something better than money. Amen. I got something better than Medicare card, than health care, Medibank. He said, look on me. He said, such as I have silver and gold, have I none? But such as I have. I give to thee. Can I tell some young person, you've got that same promise. That's your inheritance. <laughs> Glory to God. Hallelujah. Praise God. And the next, go. he goes to the next well. The next well is called Sidon. And that's, that word comes from this, the root word Satan. Sitna. It also means accuser. That's what Satan means, accuser of the brethren. Let me tell you, when you've done all that you can, and you come away from this conference, God has touched you and given to you incredible things, the enemy's going to come against you. I'm going to tell you, he doesn't want you to succeed. Satan doesn't want you to experience what God has for you, your inheritance, and he's going to come against you. He is our arch enemy. Let me tell you, like we heard last night, he's under our feet. Amen. All we've got to do is stand. The Bible says, resist the devil and he'll flee from you. Uh, submit yourself to God, resist the devil and he'll flee. But the problem is, is that we're not resisting, we're not fighting. And we're allowing the accusations of the enemy to grip us. and cause us to be defeated and walk away from God. That's what he does, he's the accusers. What's he accusing us of? He's accusing us of lies. Anything that would cause you to not receive your inheritance. Oh, you don't need that. You don't need to pray. And, and you know, Isaac, his inheritance had a lot to do with his identity. 
His inheritance affected who he was and how he saw himself. Can I tell you, that's how the devil fights you. He doesn't come like a scary a guy in the red pajamas and a pitchfork and a tail. But he comes with lies into our hearts, into our minds, to make us think that we are lesser than what we are. He makes us think, well, you, you, you've been naughty this week and you don't deserve anything from God. And that's why we walk in a defeatist mentality. We're continually looking for good things that we can say, here, God, I did this this week and therefore I deserve this. That's a defeatist mentality. But when you come to recognize who you are, when you come to an understanding of your identity, that you're not just old Joe Blow and it's not just the old me, but if you come to recognize that you are a child of God, that you are a son of God and you are a daughter of God and your father who loves to bless you, who gets joy and happiness when his children are prospering, amen when we come to recognize that I'm telling you it will change amen the way that you see your life it will change the way that you see yourself amen even some of you here tonight came in walking and thinking oh I don't know if I can really praise him and I don't know if I really deserve this and maybe you came in here with all kinds of problems can I tell you that's what the devil does amen is that he'll take the well of your identity and he'll try to stop it so here it is this is a rock Wait. Said, well, I, I got I got offended. Somebody didn't say hello to me. Bitterness. I get all bent out of shape. There is the first rock right there. Well, you know, I, I messed up. You know, I looked at something bad and I looked at it for a little too long. And I don't think God will ever forgive me. So we take condemnation. Here it is condemnation there it goes stop that water flowing this is remember this is a well it's not a bucket I know it looks like a bucket or maybe we come in and think well you know my heart's filled with other things that I want to do can't wait to get out of church want to go and do this and want to go and taste this and taste that and there's a love for worldliness Satan has that has a field day with that and said okay there you go worldliness and there's still some water seeping there's still a little life there's still something there and then all of a sudden we 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 fall we falter and we make a mistake we filled with pride and arrogance who does a pastor think he is that he can talk to me like that how dare he preach that to me I know he was looking at me He didn't say my name, but I know he was referring to me. And, and everybody else in the church has no idea who he's talking about. But he's just calling me out. There we go. Then we get a little, a little envy. Oh, look, look, look at her with her new dress. Where did she get the money for that? I lent that woman $50 two weeks ago, and now she's got a new dress. She still hasn't paid me back. My God. <laughs> but yet, then one day we're walking, and, and we, you know, we, we see somebody, and, and they said, oh, you know, uh, heard a rumor about you, and somebody said this, and we get all upset. And we know it's not true, but yet we still get upset because rumors were said. And so, there it is. That, that that's pretty much seals it. There's rocks. They're, they're meant to be rocks, by the way. That's about the extent of my creativity. Pride and arrogance fill us. Bitterness and unforgiveness. Things that Satan accuses us of. And then finally, the, the, the seal of it all is, is just our self-condemnation. That is the seal. There's no way out. We've condemned ourselves. Condemnation grips our hearts. And we are void, empty. And we're dry. And we find ourselves drying up because there's no water. 
there's no no drink no sustenance for our soul and we see ourselves never being able to make it hallelujah the Bible tells us in Galatians in the text that we read it says that they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham that means that we are the children of Abraham and we receive the inheritance that is reserved for the children of Abraham simply because we have faith isn't that amazing it's that simple it's you you don't have to climb Mount Everest you don't have to cross the seven seas for you to be able to recognize your inheritance and your heritage but by simply believing by simply understanding and believing in your heart amen that I am a child of Abraham and therefore I am an inheritor I deserve and will receive the inheritance that is due to the children of Abraham through Jesus Christ amen so we have everything that we need in our lives by simply believing I, I read something the other day it's what experts believe and this comes from a small part of the brain called the reticular activation system it turns on and off your perception of ideas and thoughts and determines the lenses through which you look at the world when you take an action like buying a new car you have taken a major step in redefining your possessions and your RAS changes to accommodate your new acquisition everywhere you go your RAS will gently remind you of this change by pointing out others who have the same car as you have ever done that and then you, you buy a new car and as soon as you drive out of the lot you see the same car hey there it is that's my car oh they're everywhere I, I thought it was unique <laughs> Or oh, you buy, buy that, that, that shoes and, and you straight away, hey, that's my shoes. Man, I thought I was the only stylish one. You, you, that's the, what they call the RAS. Amen. It's simply because you start to send a signal to your mind about what you believe. This is somewhat like faith. When you believe that you are a child of God and you believe his word for your life, amen, then you will begin to not walk in condemnation, to not walk in the defeatist mentality that has gripped our hearts and minds. But when you really recognize that you are a child of God, you're going to walk in victory. You're going to walk in the blessings of God. Amen. You're going to be, you're going to be drawing blessings. I know this may sound like some psycho, psycho babble mumbo jumbo, but can I tell you, this is faith. Amen. That you become a child of God simply by the faith that you have. And so if you believe that you are a son of God, if you believe that you are a daughter of God, and you start to walk in that identity and that belief every day, I'm telling you, you're going to be drawing the blessings of God. Amen. The doors are going to be open for you. No matter what you face. Hallelujah. You're going to see the blessings of God. Man, this is a massive. No wonder you guys seem so far away. There you are. Now I can see you. I'm just preaching to the blank. Stare the abyss. But it's, it's about our identity. Once you recognize who you are. He recognized, hang on a minute, that well is mine. And the reason why we don't access the promises of God is because we're still battling these identity, these thoughts, this your, your self-talk that continue to define you and tell you, no, you're no good. You messed up last week, therefore you can never make it. Amen. You've got to silence those voices. I'm not saying, I'm not talking about a name and a claim it kind of doctrine, but you simply got to repent and take him at his word. And when you take him at his word, I'm telling you, you'll begin to realize who you you are. Amen. I'm not the old loser that I was. I'm not the, I was a drug addict, but that's not me anymore. That doesn't define who I am. I'm a child of God. And so whether you like the sermon or not, I convinced myself I'm okay. I'm doing all right. Amen. Because God is on my side. See, this is what happened to the prodigal son. Y'all know the story. He sold it all, his birthright, he gave it up, and somebody said it was like he was, he was given up on his relationship with his father. That's what he did. He, he pretty much stuffed his well with his desire for worldly pleasures and entertainment and all that. He stuffed his well. 
until he finds himself wallowing with the pigs, eating and wanting to eat the husks of the corn. And you know what the Bible says? When he, something came over him, I'm like, dude, I, I, it would have come over me like when I lost the money. I wouldn't have even stepped one foot into the pig pen. But when he was in the, with the pigs, like he, he wanted to eat the husks. He couldn't even eat that because he, they wouldn't even give him that. But you know what the Bible says? It says when he came to himself, when he came to a revelation and understanding of who he was, Yes, he knew that he was in a bad place. He recognized he was in a terrible situation. But this, listen to what he said. He said, hang on a minute. In my father's house, uh, you know, even the servants are doing better than I am. And here I am. Uh, just my identity, my self-esteem has dwindled and deteriorated down to the level of a pig. And then when he came to himself, the Bible says, he said, oh, I, maybe if I go to my father's house, maybe if I take a step, uh, towards my father's house uh, and then I know I'll be able to see something uh, it'll be better than what I'm getting there uh, and you know what happens uh, when the, son, the prodigal son came running down uh, uh, come here son come here come up here okay Kang you're, you're a big boy you stand over there you're the prodigal son right and you smell and you stink and you've been hanging out with the pigs and, and you're weak because you haven't eaten and, and you're making your way reluctantly to your father's house not sure whether he's going to be accepted, come, come walking down slowly, take your time. Like you're weak, remember that. You're bent over and you're dragging your feet, basically. You're dragging your feet. Well, okay, well, go back a little bit. Go back. A little bit. Okay, you're walking back to your father's house. You know what happens? The Bible says the father saw him a way off. That means he was outside looking out and when he saw him, hold on, slow down. <laughs> So when he saw him, you know what he did? The Bible says the father ran to him like he was racing Usain Bolt and he hugged him. He restored him. Hallelujah. And this, this son, he said, Father, whatever you want me to do. He said, no, no, son, you ain't my servant. He gave him a ring of sonship. And he put his jacket, his cloak over him. You know what that means? That means identity. That immediately, immediately, he didn't have to work his way back to being a son. But right away, he was restored. His identity was restored. You are the son of God. You are my child. Hallelujah. Glory to God in this young man last year, a conference in Melbourne last year, he had filled with demons. God delivered him from demons, filled him with the Holy Ghost. Now here he is, worshiping God, dancing for the Lord. <laughs> Hallelujah. I wonder tonight, is there anybody in this place that said, Devil, I've had enough of your lies. I'm going to remove bitterness from me. I'm going to remove arrogance and pride. I'm going to remove it. I'm going to take every bit of lie. I'm going to remove it. Is there anybody here? Come on, somebody. Hallelujah. Take away the bitterness. You got to dig whatever you got to do to dig out of your heart. Amen. Anything that's blocking the Holy Ghost. <laughs> Glory to God. Hallelujah. You got to do whatever it takes, somebody. Whatever. What's blocking the flow? Is it religiosity? Is it because you had the Holy Ghost 20 years and you've seen everything there is to see? Can I tell you there's more to Jesus that you haven't seen? There's more to Him that you haven't seen than you have seen. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. You got to go back to the source. Go back to where it comes from. Let the flow of the Holy Ghost. Amen. I want you to know the Spirit of God is here. I feel something moving me here tonight. I feel something moving me to tell you the Spirit of God will gush forth out of your heart. He'll revive your soul. He'll revive you. Hallelujah. Glory to God. You may be seated. I got to... I gotta close, this is my only time. Hallelujah. It's the battle that we have 
That's the fight, the battle in our minds and our hearts. And we've got to dig out whatever's blocking there. Maybe, maybe it's a little pride. I don't want to show out too much because you know, they might think I'm freaky, crazy. <laughs> or maybe it's just the same expectation. And, and you know, we, we, we can't do without our, some of our traditions. Some, not all traditions are bad. Some traditions are good, and we've got to have order, and we've got to have routine. But can I tell you what our inheritance is? What we inherited was something that was organic, it was dynamic, it turned the world upside down. And I'm telling you, this is what we've got to go back to. I'm preaching to myself here tonight. I'm talking to this preacher that I want a revival that I can always quantify with numbers. I want a move of God that I can always control. You know what the Bible says? Jeremiah said, my people have committed two evils. He said, they've forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and they have hewn for themselves cisterns or bowls, containers that cannot hold any water it's broken and they've forsaken the fountain of living waters that will provide you know what he's saying my people just want to have a cute little religion they want to have just something that they can contain and God said no that's no good I can't be contained in the box I'm too big for that you can't contain me in your little ecclesiastical mindset and mentality hey man I'm too big for that I'm too powerful I need to flow like a river I need to flow like a well of water that will flow unto everlasting life. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That's what we were born in. That's our inheritance. I'm sorry. I wasn't born in this. I wasn't born a Pentecostal thing. Thank God for you young people that are born in this and are loving God and loving Jesus. I commend you with all the pressures of the world with all of the temptations i commend you for keeping your foot in the house of god but you know when god found me i was 17 18 years old dealing drugs out of my house selling pot this my, most of you know my testimony but for the sake of maybe a guest here what you're looking at here today was somebody that wasn't brought up in this i was stoned nearly every day of my year 11 and year 12 high school years every day and i would sell drugs out of my house my, I, had, I had my favorite customer that would come every day. He was a Fijian guy. He was my brother. He was my number one customer, Brother Frank, and he never paid. <laughs> he never paid. He was free. He was because he was big, you know, so I, I, he was my muscle, you know, I wasn't going to mess with him. And one day he came back, he, we were having a party in my place, and he came, he came with a Bible in his hand. And we just started, wow, laughing at him and making fun of him. And he says, guys, I've been to this church, and you got, you got to come with me to this church. It is amazing. And, and there was a whole bunch of us there, and we're like, yeah, whatever, dude. And we, we kind of laughed at him. We mocked him. We, we humiliated him. And he didn't really know the Bible very well, and so he was just new. And so by the end of the night... His Bible had disappeared somewhere under the bed and, and he was drunk and stoned again. Okay? And, and I said, and I thought to myself, well, so much for that, so much for his religion. The following week he came back, and, I, I, and please forgive me if this is a bit too graphic for some. He came back and uh, again he had another Bible in his hand. It was a different Bible, of course, because we use the other Bible for cigarette paper. Uh, I know, I've repented. I've been baptized since then. <laughs> and, and again, we kind of teased him. We mocked him. We made him laugh. And, and he didn't know how to stand. He was still very young. He, he didn't even have the Holy Ghost or anything like that. And by the end of the night, again, his Bible disappeared under the lounge. And, and he was off his face. He was gone. And I think again, man, so much for that. But, but those two times, it... it spoke to me I think man what is he talking about I've never seen my brother like that doing that the third week he came back again another Bible somebody's spending money on this boy he's getting three Bibles and this time I was alone there was nobody else in the house so so I couldn't sort of jump him you know otherwise he was gonna slap me around 
And, and he started telling me about it. I said, what are you talking about? He said, bro, you got to come to this church. It was a Belmore. He said, he said, there's something, man, it's powerful. I said, look at this. And he started showing me in Book of Acts, Acts 2.38, they received the Holy Spirit. What, are you, what is that? He said, man, just come with me. So that Sunday, I, I put on my best nightclub clothes that I could find in my wardrobe. He said, Cause you got to dress up. These guys, they, they wear ties and stuff. So I, I, I found, you know, something that kind of stunk of cigarettes. And I put that on, walked in, thought I was looking sharp and swag. And got in there, I tell you, I was blown away. I thought, man, these guys are nuts. They're absolutely crazy. It was the old Belmore building, Pentecost, uh, Grace Tabernacle. Floorboards were going up and down. The place was packed. People were running up and down. People were just were swinging from the chandeliers. They were climbing the walls and biting the ceilings. And they sat me right in the front row. Never been a Pentecostal church. They sat me right in the front row. And I said, bro, are you sure these people are okay? Or maybe I thought it was the drugs that were still coursing through my system. Am I seeing things, bro? Come on. I tell you, by the end of the night, the preacher finished preaching. He called an altar call. I literally took two steps to the altar. I knelt down and I said, what do I do, bro? He said, man, just, just pray. And I began to pray. And, and, you know, I just remembered this song that he used to sing all the time. This got stuck in my head. It was called, I Remember, I Surrender All. And, and I started praying that song. I said, I surrender all, Jesus. And at that moment, brothers and sisters, I felt this something come over me and I began to speak in tongues. And they were saying, that's it, that's it. And I was speaking in the Holy Ghost and I didn't even know what I was saying, but I'm telling you, it was the greatest experience. I thought it was the drugs, to be honest with you, that were still in my system, but I'm telling you, it was the greatest experience that I ever had. And my brother was looking at me because he'd been trying to get the Holy Ghost for three months and still couldn't get the Holy Ghost. And here I was, first night at church, and I get the Holy Ghost. And he's looking at me and said, man, how did that happen? But I'm telling you, I got the Holy Ghost. I had such a case of the Holy Ghost that when they closed the church building, they turning off the lights. They were closing the windows. I was still at the altar speaking in tongues. And my brother said, come on, Stan. We've got to go. They closing the doors they're closing the church i had the holy ghost so much i couldn't even speak english anymore i was still speaking in tongues and he said i said i was just pointing to my mouth i said i couldn't even speak english anymore and he said come on just put your hand over your mouth and let's go so i walked out of there I'm telling you, that's what the Holy Ghost does. It can take and flow a river of water to flow out of you. The Spirit of God will begin to flow out of your life. Hallelujah. It's still the same Spirit. It's still the same Holy Ghost. He's not boring. He's not dead, dull. He's still full of life. He's still full of life. Oh, hallelujah. Glory to God. I'm going to close with one more story as the musicians make their way. I've, I've told this story about every time. I've probably told it this conference already. But there's some young people here who probably don't remember. So I'm going to tell it for their sake. And it fits well with my message. So, After two years of living for God, you know, I, I was still struggling. I was at the altar every Sunday. I was at the altar every service. I think, man, what's wrong with me? had so many issues as a teenager come from an abusive background abusive father I was a very angry teenager I was violent and when I came to God I just man I just couldn't understand myself I said what is going on you know I just thought I was I was one of those emotionally dead people because you know people all around the church everyone's crying and except me I'm the only one not crying I thought, man, there's, I, I've got an emotional problem. I realize I'm just a bloke. <laughs> I'm just a guy. But I, I would just, I would get so upset because everybody's crying and, and I'm not crying. So I try to think of sad thoughts to make me cry. <clears throat> I, I, wasn't thinking, I wasn't even thinking about Jesus. I was thinking of sad thoughts. Of those children in Africa and Asia. <laughs> But 
Unlike some people, you know, they just cry like a tap. They just start to flow. And, and then I went back to the Philippines after two years. I went to my grandfather's funeral. And after the funeral, I went to, to visit the local UPC church there. And this, this blows me away. I went to the church. It was, a, it was a poor church. It was just like cement floors, cement walls. It was wooden benches for pews. And, and I, I sat behind an old man, and he was started shaking under the power of God. And, this, and from the very first song that, that, that came on, I started to cry. It's like somebody turned on a tap. And I was just like sobbing like a baby. I think that's one of the reasons why I probably don't cry. Because once I start crying, it's like uncontrollable. <laughs> like it, it's ugly. It's, it's not pretty. So I do it in private, you know. But from the first song service of this church, I, and nothing seemed familiar to me in that church, but I just couldn't stop crying. And, and at the end of the service, I met the pastor, and I started introducing myself, and he, and, and, uh, you know, he, he started asking me about who I was. And, and I t he said to me, he, he said to me, what was your, what's your family name again? And so I gave him the family name. It, it's Toledo. And, uh, and then he said, oh, do you know so-and-so? I said, yeah, that's my aunt. He goes, that's your aunt? I said, yeah, she was, you see, before we left the Philippines when I was six years old, my mother used to work in the city, and my aunt, her older sister, used to look after me and my sister up until the age of six when we left the country. And uh, he says, and you know what he said to me? She was, she's in Canada now. And, and he said, your aunt was a member of this church, was a member of the United Pentecostal Church around the corner from where I was born and where I went to up to the age of six. And he said, I remember you. Because she was my babysitter. She used to bring you here and we used to pray for you. <laughs> and the tears kept flowing. I said, you got to be kidding me. All this time, you see, there was only one UPC church in Sydney when I got saved. And, and, and God brought me to that one church. There was hundreds of other churches. But God led me to that one church that I filled with the Holy Ghost on the first night that I stepped in. And I come to realize that wasn't the first night I stepped into the Pentecostal church. I used to go to one when I was a little child and can barely remember... And then it dawned on me, I came to realize, hang on a minute, that's too coincidental to be a coincidence. That can't be a coincidence. That's the hand of God upon my life, even when I was a little child. Hallelujah. And even though I went wayward in the world, God brought me back to my inheritance. I've got an inheritance that I am victorious, that I am more than a conqueror. I want you to know you've got the same inheritance, that you can do all things through Christ that strengthens you. Amen. That even if the enemy comes in like a flood, the Lord's going to raise up a standard against him. If you lay hands on the sick, in Jesus' name, they shall recover. Amen. If you walk in faith, in the power of God, I'm telling you, it's the same inheritance. You may not have that same kind of story. You may not have that same kind of testimony, but I needed that. I need for God to show me because I was so weak as a Christian. I didn't think I could ever make it. When I heard that, when I found that out, I came to realize, my Lord. This is not just me. My friends used to say to me, the only reason you're a Christian is because you use Christ as a crutch because you could never make it in the world. And I used to believe that. But then when I understood that fact, I understood what happened to me. I came to realize that God's hand is upon me and hear me today. You might not have the same story, but I want you to know, listen to this preacher tonight. I speak to you in the Holy Ghost that you are just as called. You are just as as uh, uh, anointed and called by God amen even if you've been in church all of your life God's hand is still upon you hallelujah glory to God would you lift your hands to the Lord I'm sorry for taking so long Glory to God. Is there anybody here tonight that needs to dig out 
some of those things that belong to you. Maybe it's just the flow of the Holy Ghost once again. You remember when you first got the Holy Ghost? How excited you were? How awesome it was? God's not a dull God. He hasn't run out of ideas. But it's still the same joy. He said, I've come to give life and life more abundantly. Hallelujah. If there's anybody here that's ready to dig, anyone got a shovel here tonight? Wants to dig deeper? I want more of you, God. Amen. Somebody here needs to claim their inheritance. God has an inheritance of a calling over your life. He's, he's inherited you to be anointed. He's inherited for you to be called and anointed by God. To be his mouthpiece. To be his evangelist. To be his pastor. To be his singer. To be his witness. Amen. Is there anyone here? Amen. I want you to dig. Dig past the lies. Dig past the condemnation. Dig past. Amen. Remove those rocks of bitterness and unforgiveness. It's time for you to remove that resentment so that the Holy Ghost can flow once again in your life. You've got to forgive that person that hurt you. You've got to forgive that person that did wrong to you. You've got to love them. Amen. Because Jesus shed his blood for you. He died on the cross that you might be set free. He died on the cross that you might be saved. Oh, hallelujah. Come on, come on. Can you dig a little deeper? Is there something that you've got to work through? You've got to fight through in your mind. Fight that emotion. Fight that condemnation. Fight the arrogance and the pride. Remove it. Remove the pride. Remove that self-righteousness. Remove that vain, that vanity, that vain glory. Remove all, all kinds of, of attitudes and, and emotions that are not pleasing to God. Come on. Is there anyone here? He said, if anyone is thirsty, come to me and drink. And he that believes, as the scripture has said, out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. You can speak in tongues. You can speak in new tongues as the evidence of the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. It's for you here today.